Let's do a home inspection on this house. Every home should be inspected every year. And I don't care where you live. I don't care where the house is. Uh, Africa, Asia, I was in Europe. Those homes need to be inspected. Um, every home should be inspected every year. If you are in a cold climate, you should inspect your roof every year for sure, at least your roof. If you have a flat roof in a cold climate, you should inspect your flat roof twice a year, before winter and after winter to see what damage was done. And a home inspection should be a part of a homeowner's routine home maintenance plan. Why? Every homeowner should have a, a friendly, their local, should know their local friendly home inspector as part of their routine maintenance plan. Why would you hire a home inspector? Well, out of the 130 million homes in the United States, 30 million of them have a defective heating, plumbing, or electrical system. 12 million have problems with water leaks. 4 million have experienced mold problems within the last year. And 7 million have serious damage to the roof. And none of these housing problems, none of them, were discovered until there was a home inspection. And this data is available from the American Housing Survey. That's why a home inspection should be part of a homeowner's routine maintenance plan in every home should be inspected. Now let's say you don't have any of those problems, right? You bought a, a home and it's only 10 years old. Well, if you recently purchased a 10 year old home, it's likely that the home has many deficiencies simply because building codes have improved since then. For example, let's say you purchased a brand new home back in 2013 in Baltimore, Maryland in the United States and it was built to code. It was brand new in 2013. Back then, the requirement for the ceiling insulation, insulation in the ceiling of the second floor, you can see it from the attic, and it was R38. That's a value that you give to the thickness and efficiency of the insulation. And the wall, framed wall insulation was R16. But today, in 2017, the requirements are R49 and R20, respectively. That's a 25% deficiency in the amount of insulation. Existing homes that are at least 15 years old that were built to code back then are likely to have major defects in their system simply because of when and where they were built. So if you're a homeowner, you need to hire an InterNACHI home inspector as part of your routine home maintenance plan. And where do you find one? Inspector Seek. Dot com. There, go there and find all of the certified home inspectors in your zip code and reach out to them. Become friends with your local InterNACHI certified home inspector. There you'll find the best inspectors in the world and make sure you hire them to inspect your home every year and look for that certification symbol. They have to have the CPI designation. If they don't, they're not one of the best. Let's say your state or province or country regulates home inspectors and you said, well, my home inspector showed me a license. Well, what a license is, is a, to show that they, that individual has reached the absolute minimum required by law to perform a home inspection very low standard. So a license means hardly anything. What you want to look for is someone who's gone beyond the absolute minimum standard of having a license, probably just passed the test, and find the certification logo. The CPI is a federally registered mark, a certification mark for the best of the best inspectors. So you want to look for something like that. A CPI an internationally certified home inspector has gone through at least a dozen courses, training courses, dozens of hours, and a dozen assessments, right? If you're a home inspector, well, you want to go to this page, natchiorg slash everything, and make sure you are taking advantage of everything that InterNACHI provides. Now, if you're a home inspector, if you're a homeowner, hold on. You're going to go through a home inspection and find defects with us 
that were not discovered until a home inspection was performed on that home. And that's too late. And if you're a home inspector, grab your notebook and start taking notes and ask questions. Let's do a home inspection on this home. What I do is I follow the standards of practice. You know, every good home inspector should follow the standards of practice. And there's a home inspection standards of practice, and that standards of practice does not require any home inspector to walk upon any roof surface, even if that's a flat roof that's only 10 feet above the ground. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. However, you are free to exceed the standards of practice. Remember that licensing being a minimum? You're allowed to exceed that minimum standard and become certified, a certified home inspector. Same thing with the standards of practice. Standards of practice is an absolute minimum. So personally, I'll tell you what I did at this inspection. I exceeded the standards of practice. Why? Well, I was trained and certified to walk upon a roof. I was a home builder. I installed roofs. I know how to be safe upon a roof. I carry big, tall ladders on my big truck, on a big ladder rack, and that's part of my brand. Big. I get up on the roof if I can safely, and I'll take pictures like this. That's part of my brand. My brand is who I am and how I distinguish myself from all the rest, right? All the, all the licensed inspectors. I'm CPI. I'm certified by Internet G, right? So I kind of distinguish myself not only by my training and my certifications, but also the services that I provide. Remember the infrared camera that we were just talking about? I use the infrared on every inspection and even on this one. Well, I climb the roof on every inspection as well. You do not have to. I do not recommend it. It is hazardous. Don't do it. You don't even need to own a ladder tall enough to get to the roof. But you are required to inspect the roof. You can inspect it from the ground, inspect it from another vantage point, uh, maybe a window, um, binoculars, or a spectroscope, which is essentially a pole with a Wi-Fi Bluetooth connected uh, camera at the top and your device at the bottom. And you can inspect a roof and even the tallest chimney um, up to about 35 feet while standing on the ground safely. That's what I recommend. But if we're in competition in the same market, I'm doing this. And you're gonna have to figure out in your marketing strategy how you're going to beat me because this is value that I think my clients appreciate. So I'm going to give them what I think they need, which is in a home inspector who exceeds the standards of practice in this particular area, right? So in your competition strategy, um, you're going to have to think about how your brand beats me, right? So during this home inspection here that we're going to do, we're also talking about marketing and branding. When I get up on the roof, I take a picture of every plane, every surface. I want to identify um, indications of problems. I want to see what's going on. I want to identify the roof covering material, maybe give an estimate on the age, a guess. It's a ridge vent, so I'm going to assume there's soffit vents, maybe gable. The valley looks good. I'm walking upon the roof. I don't see any cracked or damaged shingles. And this is another um, photograph that I put into my best marketing piece that I make every day, which is my home inspection report. Home inspection report is your best marketing piece. It's not your business card, it's not your website. It's your home inspection report. Your home inspection report is your best marketing piece. Why? Because if I just look, read your home inspection report, I should have enough information in your home inspection report to make a decision on whether or not I should hire you as a home inspector. One of the things that I do is I make sure that my brand, the messages that I want to send out of my brand about who I am and what distinguishes me from all the rest, is so that photograph is in my inspection report. And that photograph too. I want to make sure that my client knows that I'm not inspecting things from afar. I'm getting up close and personal and touching things, right? So this laminated shingle roof covering material is in good shape. Ridge vent. I look at anything that penetrates the roof, like a chimney or um, an attachment, 
uh, a skylight. Um, this is a, a drain waste vent main stack pipe. I want to make sure that the, the pipes are in good shape with flashing. While I'm at the gable side, um, I'll take a look at the number of layers of shingles. I really want to see just one, not more than one. So check with your local authority, um, local code, and authority having jurisdiction, your local township inspector. Um, they may have um, local rules overrule national rules. So if the local code says you can't have more than one layer of asphalt shingles, then that's a good place to look for that defect, right, on the edge. The gutters are in good shape. Now, there's a, a downspout here discharging a lot of water, hundreds of gallons of water during a, a home inspection, uh, sorry, during a rainstorm. And it's dumping it right next to that corner there. It's a critical area. It's like the bottom of a valley, right? But it goes right into um, an outside corner. This is the front right corner of the house. And another roof plane starts. And there's a lot of things going on here. There's a stucco applied. There looks like there's a, uh, an insulation detail um, applied to maybe hard cut coat stucco. Um, the stucco goes all the way down to the shingle. We want a, a clearance. Um, I like to see at least a, an inch or two to, so that I can see metal flashing. I don't, I can't see metal flashing there. And I do see some silicone and I see a piece of white aluminum there that looks like a piece of flashing, like a kick out, but um, it's not properly installed. It's not a proper kick out flashing. So I have some concerns here. While I'm inspecting one system, I'm thinking about other things in my head. I want to make sure that I get my face under this area because I want to see with my infrared camera, my moisture meter, my flashlight, if there's any indications of water intrusion in this area because right now my confidence is kind of low in this area. Maybe it's not leaking, but that is a lot of water going around a corner with no visible flashing and a stucco problem in the uh, improper kickout flashing at that gutter edge. So a house is a system of interdependent parts. One part affects all others, essentially. So I want to make sure that this system, this roof system, flashing system, isn't affecting something else underneath. Is there moisture underneath? Is there mold? Is there ventilation? Things like that. Soft vents, good. In the attic, if I can get in there, I'm going to look at the eaves, the gutter edges, and make sure I see daylight. I want to see those open soffit vents so that there's ventilation going in to the unconditioned attic space and exhausting out the ridge vent that we saw previously in the pictures. So a couple of different vantage points. I see the bottom edge, the termination of the stucco, but it's resting upon the shingles. What we like is some clearance so that um, water intrusion behind this hard coat stucco, if it happens to penetrate there, it can drain away easily. Um, and I can confirm that step flashing was properly installed and the siding is the counter flashing. Um, and that I can tell the, the type of stucco um, if I use one of these guys. Do you have one of these? Ta -da. Yeah. So it's um it's a mirror. Oh, this one has a light, doesn't it? Boop. And um you can run your mirror along the bottom there of the stucco to see if there are holes. Um drain holes, moisture drainage. Is this a moisture drainage system? Um so there's different types of stucco. There's about 12 different types of stucco, and it's good to have the knowledge of um, most common types, um, hard coat, eaves, moisture drainage. And we have free online training courses specifically for home inspectors to identify the types of stucco um, correctly. So you may want to check that out. That's online. It's one of the resources um, that we provide members. Chimney stack, I can see, um, yeah, it's probably a fireplace chimney stack outside of the building envelope. Probably not the heating system. 
I hate it when the satellites uh, are just drilled into the top of the roof surface um, using bolts or screws. Anything that penetrates that shingle covering is um, a point of moisture intrusion. Um, it needs to be properly flashed or sealed, but that sealant um, is temporary. It's like a Band-Aid. That sealant will not last more than a couple years. Um, it could be leaking right now. So um, that's a problem. Skylights should have step flashing, apron, head flashing, counter flashing. Looks in good shape. I don't see any problems with the shingle roof. There's a porch roof, low slope. I don't like it. Hopefully there's ice and water shield or double layers. Um, when you go really low with asphalt shingles, you have to do things with the underlayment that's different. If it's very low, it's just flat, you really can't use shingles at all. Um, so this is a very low roof. And if you wanted to do a, um, a slope measurement, um, not required by the standards of practice, but it gives you a good idea um, because um, the way asphalt shingles are installed, um, a, a lot of it depends upon the slope of the roof. And use the word slope, not pitch. Pitch is that black stuff. So you can use one of these things. Or um, what I like is, let's see. Let's see if I can get that app. Oh, I can't, I'm not hooked up. Maybe I can just show you like this. So here's an app, right? And if you tilt it, oh, if you tilt it like that, you can tell the slope. So oh, it's, a, it's a 412, right? And you can also take a picture. So that's kind of cool. If you're using a mobile device, and you should be, for writing your inspection report, that'll pop right in to your roof section there. Um, oh, just real, real quick. Uh, Craig asks, will this count for CE? Yes. So every member has an education log. You go into your members only account, click the education log, you click the button that says add credits, and you add the information there and it'll show up in your education log. If you're taking an online course through InterNACHI, provided by InterNACHI, those CEs will automatically show up in your education log. You don't have to enter it. Uh, is there such a thing as a grandfather law where a home is exempt of a current deficiency since it was built to code back then? No, we just went through that, right? So well, another example that I give is um, uh, my home. Uh, my home um, was built in 1975, right? <clears throat> built a code back then. <coughs> However, <coughs> the space between the spindles of the, of the railing, of the guardrail going up, right, the handrail, at the stairs, interior stairs, is large enough for a child to fall through. It's eight inches. Eight inch, it's not six. It's not four. It's eight inches. It's big enough for a kid to fall through, right? We had... Uh, instead of changing all the guard uh, guardrails uh, the spindles we just put up a barrier for our kids right so they wouldn't fall through right so if i was dealing with a real estate agent which is what happens sometimes a real estate agent will say well it was it's grandfathered right that defect is grandfathered well i i want them to say that again in my ear like that defect is grandfathered that that safety hazard that thing that could kill a kid is grandfathered really is that where you're going to say, like, I don't care when the house was built. I really don't. I don't care if it's brand new or 35 years old, right? I'm looking for defects. And if there's a defect, like space between the spindles, large enough for a child to fall through and die, right? I'm going to call that out. And I'm not going to be in that game of saying, well, back then it was okay. Now, code changes, building standards, building practices, construction methods change usually because we've learned something about building science and we've implemented it in, in the code. It doesn't happen very much. Or someone got hurt. That's really, that's basically about it. Maybe a new technology like a GFCI or an AFCI was invented, right? And, but that's about it. It's usually, you know, the fire code changes because unfortunately a lot of firemen get hurt during a fire and they say, well, you know, to prevent more people getting hurt, we want this code change. So saying that something was built to code back then is just 
confirming that houses built to code in the past have innate deficiencies and defects built in them. That's why, I don't know if you missed it, but previously we've said that every home needs to be inspected. And we gave an example about if you, if you bought a home 10 years ago in Baltimore, Maryland, there's a, there's a deficiency now in the home, insulation, in the walls and in ceilings, because simply the house was built to code back then and code changes over time. So it's, it's a great idea to get a home inspection. If you're a homeowner listening, it's a great idea to get a home inspection to find those defects. And if you're a home inspector, you ought to think about inspecting the home regardless of age so that you don't get involved with um, excluding obvious safety hazards simply because, well, it was built to code back then. So I felt it was like a, a freedom when I realized I want to inspect a home regardless of its age, right? And um, at InterNACHI, we update all of our online training and courses and assessments based upon the most recent code changes, the NFPA and the IRC. That's what we use. All right, good question, darn good question. Uh, Craig says, what if the doors to enter the home are boarded up? That will never happen in our company because we ask the seller or their agent or the occupant to make sure that the electricity is on, the water is on, the fuel is on if there's fuel supply, and there's access to the home. Oftentimes, we want to go there a couple, few days early to place a radon test because we are in a, an area of the country where one out of two homes had high elevated levels of radon. So we went in there before. Uh, my, my radon tester went in before me, got access, got in, <clears throat> did a quick evaluation, and sent obvious things to the inspector who's going to arrive a few days later. And um, so that never happens, right? All pit bulls are removed from our property. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work involved. If you have a, a programming system uh, maybe a scheduling system through your website or or maybe you want to develop one. Um, there are a lot out there that help you manage these things autom autom uh, automatically so that you can arrive to a home and the home is essentially ready for you. That's where you want to be. You want people working for you. You want the seller and occupant and real estate agent working for you to help prepare for the home inspection, to have a really good home inspection and quick. And there's actually a checklist that we have to help you communicate what you need prior to arriving to a home inspection, right? Um, does your answer apply to asbestos and nomen tube if it's in good condition? Um, uh, asbestos is a hazardous material, right? If, if it's present, and um, I can indicate, I can um, uh, show evidence of indications of uh, its presence. Um, I used to be a EPA lead hazard risk assessor and um, asbestos tester, you know. So um, if you're not that, though, if you're just a home inspector, you should really just um, describe what you observe. You observe indications of a hazardous material, asbestos. And you really shouldn't say that it's in good condition or friable condition. Uh, it's in bad condition. We, you don't want asbestos to be friable or in poor condition, um, flaking, because it becomes airborne. And it floats in the air, and people will inhale it. And that causes cancer, right? So it's a hazardous material. If you see indications of any of it, make sure it's in the report, right? And it's really up to you on what you want to do. I was really hard. If I saw asbestos material at all, even lead-based paint indications of that, um, I put it in my report. And I uh, recommended further testing and evaluation by a professional. Um, Nom and tube, um, you can't say that it's in good condition because you can only see about 1% of it, right? You don't know if it's in a wall cavity covered by insulation. It could be. 
all you know is you see indications of knob and tube wiring components, which may indicate further um, uh, installation throughout the house, right? What you can look for is, um, what you should report upon is your observations of defects that you observed during the inspection. So if I see knob and tube wiring covered by insulation, I'm going to say, I, during my inspection, I observed indications of knob and tube wiring covered by insulation, which is a safety and fire hazard, right? Further evaluation and recommended and all that stuff, right? If I see knob and tube wiring in the, in the basement of a very old home, I'm going to say just about the same thing, right? I'm going to call it an electrical hazard. It's a material defect. I'm going to call it out because I don't know if it's in good shape or bad shape. All I know is, that's, oh man, if you got an and tube wiring, you got a problem, right? It's like Federal Pacific panels too. There are certain things that home inspectors know, you know, lead-based paint with dust on the floor is bad for babies, children under five. They crawl around, they put that lead dust paint in their mouth, and now uh, it won't excrete from their bodies, right? So there are a few things, environmental hazards, that you should um, that you should be aware of through training and certification through InterNACHI. That's why the best home inspectors are InterNACHI inspectors. And um, develop how you communicate your observations. Which brings me to, we haven't even gotten off the, off the roof yet. Which brings me to, are you required to report upon every defect in a home? Yes or no? I'm not moving from this slide until you answer. Are you required to report upon every defect that exists in a home? Yes or no? No, excellent. You guys are awesome. Highly intelligent. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, you're not required to report upon every defect. You are required to report upon defects that you both observe and deemed to be material, really bad defects, serious problems, things that are going to hurt someone, right? If you see a hole in the roof, right? If I saw a hole in the roof and I didn't put it in the report, that's a bad thing. That's a mistake there. But if you observe a hole in the roof and you deemed it to be a bad defect, a major defect, you're required to report it, right? Most homes, as you saw previously, out of the 130 million homes, millions of homes have defects. A lot of them you can't see, right? A lot of homeowners live with defects they don't even know exist until they have a home inspection. And even then, I would say most, you could argue most defects are hidden from view during a, a typical home inspection, right? So don't ever say you're required to find don't ever think you're required to find every defect. You're not required to find every defect. It's impossible. So there's a chimney. Again, the flashing is a concern. I don't see a nice termination of the stucco. I'll take a look at that on the other side. Skylights look pretty good. There's a tennis ball in the, in the gutter. If you don't know enough on how to inspect a roof, no problem. Go to our education page, natcha.org slash education, and do a little search on the page for roof. And we have a ton of courses. A lot of them are video-based, and some are with illustrations and things like that. Okay, so now I'm on the ground. And I inspect using a mobile device. Why? Because I want my life at night. I don't want to be sitting at my office desk at home after dinner, writing the report, trying to remember what pictures I took eight hours ago, right? I want to beat my competition and um, write a great report at the same time. I want to be efficient too with my time. I don't want to waste my time at night writing reports when I can be writing them while inspecting. And I'm gonna beat my competition because at the end of this inspection, I click a button and I send an email with the summary 
of the report to my client. If I wanted to send them the entire report, I could do that too. But oftentimes, I'll hold off and go, hmm, is there anything I want to add? Anything juicy I missed? Anything I want, additional information I want to attach to this report, and then I'll send the report later. But I can immediately send a summary report at least. I can do the whole shabam too, right? And it's pictures and video because I take pictures and video during my inspection, send it to the cloud, send an email to my client, say download that report, and it has, um, infra it has the entire report with pictures and video. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how somebody can judge you upon your home inspection report. It's one of the best marketing pieces you can work on. It's one of the best, um, most valuable time that you have um, can be wisely spent on improving your home inspection report. You don't waste any time by improving your inspection report. Any time you can get during lunch hour, in between jobs, improve on your inspection report. So I'm on the roof. Uh, so I'm on the ground right now. I just inspected the roof. And before I touched the ground, came off my ladder, touched the ground, I'm, I was actually done with the system. I was done writing the report for the roof. I was done taking the pictures and the video of the roof. And that system is done. Now I'm on the second system, which is the exterior. I'm going to go around the exterior, take my client around. I like to take them around with me so that they can, um, except for the roof. No one goes on the roof except me so that my client can ask me questions and I don't have to answer them at night or the next day. I get everything done while I'm inspecting. It takes a long time. It takes a f maybe the first 50 or really difficult, maybe the first 100, maybe your first year is difficult to inspect, write, take pictures, take video, and explain things to your client at the same time, but you get a hang of it. I have a stucco problem at the chimney. It's cracked. Zoom in, take some pictures, put it in the report, goes all the way up to the corner. I'm not sure what's going on, but it needs further evaluation. It looks like it's bulging out. When I see stu stucco bulging out, the first thing I think of, my knee-jerk reaction is, what the substrate that it's applied to is rotting and compressing, and the structure is actually settling a little bit, and the stucco is bulging out. I just think of water penetration when I see stucco. So much fun to find water intrusion with stucco. There's, that's me going around the exterior, maybe going up to the gutter edge, maybe going up on a lower porch roof to get to the uh, other advantage points. So it all looks pretty good, except for that stucco at the chimney. That's going to be in the report. And there's step flashing, not properly installed. You should never really see step flashing, maybe a thin edge of it. But if it's properly installed, it's tucked underneath the row of shingles. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Flashing, flashing around the skylights, flashing. Stucco is smack up against the roof covering materials here at this rear porch roof. And it's heavily sealed with silicone. And there's at least two layers of silicone. Something's going on. Something's not right with how the stucco is smashing up against the layer of shingles. There's supposed to be a separation. You should be able to see the termination, the flashing, and the step flashing, right? And we don't see that here. In fact, we see a Band-Aid, a bunch of silicone installed. And you only do that when there's a water leak and you don't have the time or money to fix it properly. So um, when I do an inspection, I shoot video. A couple of shots. The roof, providing ventilation for the attic space. The exterior stucco on this side of the chimney stack is in need of repair with some. All right. And then there's um, there's apparently a problem with the flashing. Um, water coming off the roof is missing the gutter and streaming down the stucco and the window shutter and down that way. We don't want water to also penetrate the wall cavity. So someone needs to take a look at that. That's that one area where there's a downspout, a corner, poor flashing, and a, a missing kickout flashing. 
that's, that should be properly installed there. So when water streams down stucco, thankfully it grabs dirt off of the surface of the roof covering materials and the gutter and streams down the exterior. So that's an indication of a water problem. There shouldn't be any water streaming down the side of a, of a, of a house. I also add a bunch of other videos. Area, the grounding wire has been cut. So the grounding, the main grounding wire, um, isn't even attached. Is original to the house, 11 years old. So that's the heat pump. Potential safety problem at the rear patio. Somebody might fall into the window well. An iron grate would be. So you have a rear patio, a concrete patio. The floor is there, but there's a hole essentially. It's two feet deep. If someone is having a party and they're sipping their lemonade and they step backwards, they're going to break a leg, right? So it should have a grill over it or some kind of safety thing. So there's a bunch of videos that I put in the report as well. And I play them at the end of the inspection. I, I load up the videos, the series of videos that I took, and I turn my computer around and I show my client all those videos at the end of the inspection because I'm in the kitchen at the very end. That's why I leave the kitchen at the very end. So I can play my videos and they're so thankful to see videos. Videos are the, the new thing. If you're not doing them, you really should be. Um, it's easy to do. I've been doing videos, uh, snippets of my home inspections since, uh, oh, for 15, 20 years. Um, now you can do them while you're inspecting using your mobile device and it's sent to the cloud so that those videos can be played um, from the cloud within the client's inspection report. So I know what this is. This is a missing kickout flashing. It's streaming water down the exterior side of the, of the stucco where the gutter end meets the stucco wall. There should be a kickout flashing. It's a piece of bent metal that kicks out water out away from the wall and into the gutter. It diverts it. And there isn't that flashing installed there. The other issue might be that not only is water streaming down the exterior, it could be streaming on the interior. The wall cavity could have water intrusion. We don't want that. There's a cracked stucco there that should be repaired. Looks like a ball or a baseball hit that. Everything else looks pretty good. Some cracking here and there needs to be fixed. Dense vegetation. I want to make sure that the ground around the house, around the building, is sloped away from the house. About six inches for the first 10 feet. Nice slope away from the house. There's some holes in the stucco, no big deal. That could be patched up. The asphalt, uh, where the stucco meets the ground, uh, it's not terminated. I don't know if it's draining, if it's a moisture drainage system, is it EVE system, it's hard coast. I would really like to use my, remember this? Use my uh, mirror to look at the bottom of the stucco. I would just go down and look, you know, at the bottom of the stucco with my mirror to see. You can identify the type of stucco using this method. You're looking at the very bottom edge where it terminates at the foundation. Um, ideally, I want clearance between the stucco and the ground. And I don't have that. So, in my mind, I'm remembering this and I'm going to go in the basement because it looks like it has a basement because of that window well. And uh, I'm going to look at the band rim joist area, the wooden components above the foundation. Looking for stucco, cracks. There's that trip hazard where somebody could fall in to the window well. Right there at the at that um, window, at the bottom of the window, there's a bulge in the stucco. So I point, I use my finger a lot. It helps give scale and identify. I don't have time to draw arrows and circles and all that silly stuff. So there's a, a bulge in the stucco you really can't see, but it's there. When I see a bulge in the stucco, I think settlement, maybe it's natural settlement, great. Or it could be water penetration behind there and the substrate has uh, lost structural integrity. I see a pipe coming out. The diameter of the pipe looks like a, a sump pump discharge. So I'm going to think about water intrusion into the basement and maybe there's a sump pump, maybe not. I'm going to try to find that sump pump and see how it's installed 
and why it's installed, right? And maybe ask the seller, why do you have a sump pump installed? Do you get a lot of water? Is there a groundwater in this area? I like these pictures because, like we said before, you can't see everything. I can't see everything that's going. There could be a hole in the stucco, you know, but I'm going to take a picture right there because if you remove the bush and you see a hole, well, it, there was a, an inspection restriction during my home inspection. I can't see everything. Steps, stoops, stairs, decks. That's a high step there. That first step to the, um, the welcoming mat is a high step. That's a trip hazard. Looks pretty good. Just taking pictures. Pictures are free. Digital pictures are easy to take when you're inspecting and you're using um, software, mobile software. Everybody should be using mobile software. Um, you can just snap a picture and make a comment, and those two things go together in your inspection report. You can also snap a, um, let's see, snap a video too. So I use Spectora software. Um, let's see if I can show you. I probably, we should do this some other time. But yeah, why don't I do this another time? Um, uh, I, I really like Spectora because it allows me to, I'm going to do it later, but allows me to, um, I'll, I'll hook up my phone next time in the next class, like I did my infrared camera. Um, so you can see what I'm doing. So I can go through my Spectora software mobile device on my mobile device and select um, like, oh, there's a bulge in the stucco. Um, and I'll type, I don't type, I just say rear side of the house, click. And then I take a picture, snap, and I take a video. And I'll say the same thing that I just said in a text. And that is a really robust home inspection report that beats my client who at night is trying to type and remember what they saw eight hours before, right? So this helps me be efficient. Um, when you write your inspection report while inspecting, you um, reduce your liability, you reduce the mistakes that you make. Um, one of the things is that if you forget what components to check maybe during the HVAC system, right? You should have it listed. Check the flu, check the fuel, check the shutoff, check the air filter, check the sound, check the fan, check, you know? And so you're, you don't miss anything while you're inspecting. It's like a, a checklist, an inspection checklist to guide your process through the house. It's a brilliant idea to use a mobile device while inspecting. So there's um, an electrical defect. Um, all exterior receptacles should be protected by a GFCI, but this one is not even installed properly. That's an easy defect there. Um, all frost-free hose bibs for cold climates should be um, functional. They shouldn't freeze in the wintertime. All electrical receptacles on the outside of the house should be um, protected by a GFCI. So for some strange reason, there was a, a football game going on, and uh, the Goodyear blimp uh, went right over my van. So I take a picture of my work vehicle, and I stick that in the report um, just to show. There it is. That's my work vehicle and big, tall ladders. I carry 40-foot aluminum ladder, 28-foot, 32-foot fiberglass ladders, 12-foot aluminum uh, step ladder to get in the attic or a short crawl space access and crawl space gear. And more exteriors. I look at the driveway, the windows, dense vegetation. So this is the exterior. Uh, some minor wood rot there could be patched up. And there's the electrical system. So on the exterior, while I'm inspecting the exterior, I'm bumping into other systems. And this is the electrical system, right? This is the main meter box, let's call it. Main line going from the meter to the 
main distribution panel, 200 amp panel down in the basement. The grounding wire has been disconnected. It's actually been cut. So that's not good. It's amazing. There's the exterior compressor, right? It's um, either an air conditioner or a heat pump. It's essentially the same thing. Um, and what I like to do is I, I like to take a picture of the components of the system and the manufacturing label. It tells me a few things. It tells me what refrigerant is being used. Back then, it was R22. It's not allowed anymore. It can tell me the date of manufacture. It can tell me the manufacturer, right? This is a York. And um, by the serial or mono number, I can use um, other resources to pinpoint the actual manufacturing date. Manufacturing date on this one was um, 1996, bottom right corner. And it's a heat pump. It's listed as a heat pump. So I cheated. There's a refrigerant line, a uh, suction line. Um, it's the large diameter line of the heat pump um, or air conditioner unit. Um, it should be insulated. So it's sweating con condensation because it's missing insulation. And that insulation, that pipe insulation is in poor condition. It should be replaced. The thin copper tube is called the liquid line. There's the shutoff for it. So they had an underground downspout for the house downspout, but maybe it clogged up, doesn't work anymore, and they now are now discharging the water to the ground. No big deal. Looking at just about anything that I can get my hands on. Even the shed in the back, the yard, I'll take a look at that real quick as a courtesy only. The interior looks okay. There's a shot from the back. Now I'm in another system. It's the garage. Joshua Stone. Ah, was this home done previously in a previous webinar? Possibly. Possibly. It could have been many years ago, though. Um, I try to find uh, homes that uh, I haven't uh, reviewed already. But this one was kind of neat because of the stucco and the kickout flashing. In a recent conversation with uh, a class that we've had here at the House of Horrors in Boulder um, prompted me to pick this, this house again. I wanted to make sure that um, this class goes over a few things like kickout flashing. It's a really important issue. So I'm in the garage, and I like to check the firewall. I want to have drywall applied everywhere to um, separate the garage from the house interior. So if a fire in the garage happens, for example, the fire company has about a half an hour to get to the garage and put it out. While I'm inspecting, I see this. It's a vent, and it has lint stuck in it. The dryer is exhausting into the, crawl, um, the garage. Um, that is a hazard, uh, a defect. Um, we don't allow anything to exhaust into the garage. Um, this is a breach of the firewall as well. Um, gases and fire can pass through that firewall, um, through this plastic vent in just a few seconds, and then enter the house. So that's a, a fire hazard that needs to be addressed. The dryer needs to exhaust outside directly. We have a new course. It's an online course, free and online to members. It's how to perform a garage inspection course. And it's at that URL, natchi.org slash garage course, one word. So there's the ceiling, the walls, inspection restrictions. There's the refrigerator, garage door, safety eyes. There's a hole cut in the ceiling of the garage. Not sure why. Maybe with some repairs or new installation or something going on, but that needs to be repaired. That's a breach in the firewall. Garage receptacles are GFCI protected. This one isn't, and it's not dedicated to anything, some kind of permanent equipment or anything. So that's a defect. All garage receptacles should be GFCI protected. Steps to the garage. I like to pull on them. Sometimes they're not even attached very well. Um, three garage door openers. 
I test them, they all work. And in that garage course, the free online course, we go through the 10 st step procedure uh, for testing a garage door, including auto reverse. So I just kick my foot through the laser beam of the safety eyes, and you can put um, something in the way to do a pressure test as well, which is recommended by DASMA. The garage door openers should be plugged into a dedicated receptacle next to the garage door. You shouldn't use a temporary extension cord for something that's permanently installed. Um, so we have an extension cord here for two out of three garage door openers. And there you go. So that should be addressed. Attic. Attic is our next system. And I bring a picnic blanket, and that's my picnic blanket, right? Because if you're on a picnic blanket and you're eating, you're certainly being clean, right? You're not um, allowing, in this case, insulation to drop on your picnic blanket. If you are, um, you're going to catch it before it touches someone else's personal items. So I protect other people's items with my own picnic blanket, right? It kind of indicates that I'm trying to be um, clean and aware of my surroundings and protecting other people's stuff while I'm doing my work. So I, I try to empty the top floor, uh, top shelf, because the attic access is in above that top shelf, unfortunately, in the attic. I put down my picnic blanket, I rest my stepladder, and I get up into the attic. And I make sure I take a picture of that too, because I don't want anybody complaining that their clothes are itchy because of insulation. So I'm in the attic, and I'm looking around. Do you remember any um, roof problems or structural problems? There's some flashing problems, but that's about it on the outside. There was that satellite kind of thing. So I'll try to find that area and see if I can find the screws. This is a hazardous situation. It's, it's not easy to crawl up in the attic. If you don't feel safe going in the attic space, you're not required to enter an unsafe condition, unsafe system. So um, I see that there's a, a little bit of plywood laid down. Um, I'm going to measure the approximate thickness of the insulation and call out the defect because it's deficient. It's not as thick as it should be. There's um, thick bat insulation um, next to the um, eave um, vents, so that's nice. Remember that? I, we want ventilation at the eaves. And anything that penetrates the structure, I'm going to take a look for water intrusion. Some electrical wires, it's okay. Other components, roof components look good. I don't see any structural problems. Lack of insulation in some areas could add more insulation. And I'm down in the, that was it. That was it for the attic. So now um, I feel like I'm done. Because I've, oh, I feel like I've, I've, I've done a lot, about half of the inspection, right? I've done some major things. I've done what? The roof, the exterior, the garage. The attic, heck, that's that's about halfway. I'm doing really good. If I started this inspection at eight o'clock in the morning, I, I also scheduled one at twelve. That gives me four hours in between my two inspections. A typical home inspection for me is three hours, so I'm out of there at about eleven, and I can get lunch and drive to the next job. By now, I'm probably halfway through, maybe an hour into it. So I'm making sure that I'm pacing myself. I don't have all day. My clients and their agents and the seller usually give me about two and a half, three hours to do an inspection. So I have to make sure that I'm on pace. And using my mobile device software helps me do that, stay on pace. And making sure I'm mentally keeping track of my progress helps me as well. So while I'm here, I'm going to do the laundry inspection. We have an inspection article in our library about performing a laundry inspection. The dryer, remember, needs to exhaust outside, and it's not. So what they did was they installed a second floor laundry, had the plumber and electrician do their work, but the exhaust went right into the garage. That's a bad thing. So while I'm in the garage, following the dryer exhaust, right, I bring out my infrared camera, and I realize the back wall 
is where that missing flashing, kickout flashing, is located as well. And my infrared shows that there's moisture there. I didn't see it with my eyes the first time around. We did the garage inspection together and there was nothing there to see. But I went around with my infrared camera and I saw an anomaly, something that looked different from the rest. The water was in uh, water, the flashing was allowing water to penetrate the, the wall and the ceiling of the garage. So this is a, a different kind of image where it's grayscale in my infrared camera. And I follow up every infrared scan with a moisture meter. I kind of like this one, X-Tech, it, because it has, um, let's see if I can get this, because it has um, the probes, right, for penetrating, and it also has um, the um, non-penetrating surface feature, and it shows me a scale, and it's audible, and that's all I need. So when you're using an infrared camera, um, and you see something like an anomaly or something odd, abnormal, um, don't say anything. Keep quiet, right? Because you want to first make sure that you follow up your observation and confirm with a moisture meter. If you think it's moisture, make sure you confirm it with a moisture meter, right? Because the infrared camera just tells you what's cool at surface temperature, what's cool, what's hot, what's warm. Everything cool isn't water. So to make sure that it's that you're you're doing a, a good job, um, make sure that you follow up every infrared skin with a moisture meter. A moisture meter is the companion to every infrared camera. Uh, this is an extendable um, probe. They don't make them anymore. Um, I can't find them, but it's essentially this moisture meter that's extended three feet so I can reach a tall ceiling like this in the garage. And it's wet. Okay, so now I'm on the hunt for water intrusion in a building cavity wall, right? The wall is allowing, is, um, there's water traveling from the roof down into the building cavity, into the wall. It's um, showing up in the garage, and I'm as water travels, it's going to go all the way down. And so I'm going to follow it all the way down. I'm going to go into the basement. This is actually a crawl space. And I'm going to see if water has traveled 10, 12 feet down into the basement, and it has. So this is what I find below that missing kickout flashing, about 12 feet below it. So there's been water traveling for years from that missing flashing area. There's probably a hole. I don't need to see the hole. Water is allowed to travel into the building cavity. The wall, the ceiling of the garage indicates moisture. And below that in the crawl space is moisture and mold and structural damage. And to move the insulation, you're not required to move insulation during a home inspection. But if you do, um, this may come in handy. So I, I exceed the standards of practice by moving insulation. It's an extendable, it's a gardening tool. It's an extendable handle. It's a hoe, it's a three tine hoe, three tines. One, I um, heat up and pound out so that it's straight. The other two are kind of hooked so that a combination of that, I can um, probe things, you know, and also I could hook things and then put them back into place. So I could probe for wood uh, rot and damage, and then move insulation and put the insulation back with this instrument. It comes in really handy. handy. And there's uh, a lot of stuff going on there. So I go to the heating system. Now the juicy parts. Oh, so I feel like I've done an amazing job for my client so far, because this is a, a major problem, major structural issue, water penetration, mold, um, flashing, roof, a lot of components.
that need to be replaced and installed. They're going to tear down this stucco and fix the structural problems, fix the flashing problems. You need a roofer, you need a stucco expert, you need exterior siding, insulation needs to be replaced. So it's a big, big problem, thousands of dollars. Now I'm going to the heating system. When I get to the heating system, my client is still with me. So we've gone through this flashing defect, major problem, but there's hardly anything you can say to kill the deal. So don't be uh, influenced by other professionals in the industry, real estate industry, that say that home inspectors kill deals. They really don't. Um, if a deal doesn't go through, it's usually because mm, it wasn't the right buyer for the property, right? Or maybe there was some financial issues that came up later, or the negotiations didn't uh, go very well. Because when you're a home inspector, your client has found their dream home that they love. And there's hardly anything that you can say to break that, right? They have gone through many homes, many open, ho open houses, events, They've searched online for houses. They got qualified for the loan. They have their real estate agent working. They visited many homes. They've seen the neighborhood. When they get to this point, they are in love with the house and they love the neighborhood and they love the school system and they love the price and the taxes and everything's good. There's hardly anything you could say to break that dream home, that love of their dream home, right? So. When you understand that, it's like you, you have freedom to um, describe defects that you observe accurately. No holding back, no soft punches. So at this point, we're still going on because my client loves the home. Even though there's a major flashing issue causing structural problems and water intrusion, they're still going through. Heat pump, it's very easy. To inspect maybe 10 minutes turn it on make sure it cycles if you're in certain areas like texas you have to um, measure the air temperature before it goes through the system evaporator and um, you have to see the delta t it has to be a, a difference in temperature high efficiency depleted media air filter um, i like to take a picture of the last time it was serviced and cleaned this is the crawl space. The crawl space has other water problems, not just the flashing issue causing water intrusion, but there's moisture in this crawl space, especially in the corner. And there's also debris just lying about. So we have moisture intrusion, hasn't been repaired or, or cleaned up. And I'm not sure what the source is. I'm looking for other structural problems, but somebody needs to address this and that's mold uh, growth. So I'm looking for structural problems caused by moisture intrusion. There's a large water puddle, indications of a water puddle. Um, I don't need my moisture meter here or my infrared camera here. It's fairly obvious what's going on. And we actually have Shazam, a how to inspect for moisture intrusion course. It's online and free to members at that URL, natchiorg slash moisture course, one word. We also have a huge free online library open to everyone. It's a library of inspection articles. It's at natchiorg slash articles. So go there too for more information. All right, Jeffrey, he's got to go. Um, he has a home inspection appointment, but again, um, this is going to be recorded and available at Natchi TV. Electric hot water tank, uh, electric line coming in. Cold water supply has a shutoff valve. TPR does not have a pipe extension to the floor. So if this discharges, this will scald and burn someone's face. So it's a safety issue. Very easy to fix by a plumber. Water supply coming in. Public water, there's a shutoff valve. There's a gate, pressure reducer, the meter itself, check, another shutoff valve jumper cable, water meter, there's a shutoff valve, ball valve. We don't turn valves, no fuel, no water valves. If the water is turned off, I ask the seller or the, their representative to turn it on. I don't turn on valves of any kind, just the fixtures, 
normal operating controls, hot and cold. There's the gate valve, pressure reducer valve, water meter, check valve. So it's a closed system after that check valve. Electric panel. You're not required to remove the dead front cover off of any electric panel. It's not required. So what I want to do is I want to identify amperage if it's labeled. So it's a 200 amp. I saw it on the outside too. And every breaker should be specifically identified. Um, this one isn't. 200 amps. Two fingers mean 200 amps. Missing labeling. I remove the dead front. You're not required to. I don't recommend it. It's hazardous. Don't do it. But when I do, um, I see things like this that jump out. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can get this. Can I get this to? No. Mm. Let's see. How do I get that to mark? Let's see. Maybe. Yeah. So here's a wire that's different from all the rest, right? It looks kind of strange. All the other ones look really nice. Right? Rip, 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 horizontally, 90 degree angles. Do, 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 do. But this one is different, right? And it's because it's also double tapped at this breaker. This line goes to something like a sump pump or something in the basement. Um, don't know. So that jumps out at me. This breaker has a double tap. I want somebody to take a look at it. And I'm also looking for overfusing as well. So I don't want um, a large breaker attached to a small gauge wire, right? Oh, and this is um, lightning arrester, this, this guy here. Yeah, so that's what's going on there. The cables look good. Drain. So we did roof, exterior, garage, attic, or laundry, lots of defects, crawl space, water intrusion, basement, water intrusion, water coming in, hot water source. Oh, the heat pump was there. Now we do drainage. This is the sewer line going out. Has a clean out, should be there. There's the sump pump. It's sitting in mud, so it's not reliable. Discharge is there. There's a garden hose too. Wonder where that's coming from. But that is not reliable. It should be in a bucket because that pump is now going to suck dirt out and just going to clog. And if it's a heavy rainstorm and that is needed, um, it's not reliable. So it's not installed professionally at all. And there's no battery backup either. Sewer lines look good. I do see where the sewer line meets the foundation wall, penetrates the foundation wall. There are water streaks coming down. Just taking a look at the poured concrete foundation and the other structural components. Uh, there's a water leak coming from that fitting, that copper fitting there. So there's a water leak now. And smoke detectors. You want carbon monoxide detectors as well if you have a, a fuel burning system. There's a drip at the, uh, this must be the second floor bathroom sink at the trap. So right there, there's a, a drip. All bathroom receptacles should be GFCI protected. Flush the toilet, run the sink, use the side of my leg to see if the toilet wobbles on the floor. Hot and cold water at the tub. This is the master bath. Hot and cold water. I take pictures of the interior. And now I'm moving through the interior. I feel like, oh, now I'm really done. Remember when I was at the attic, I got a big chunk of that inspection completed. Now I'm probably two hours in, I have another hour left and I'm blowing through the interior because it's very easy. It's when a representative number of windows and doors and lights and, and testing things and moving things and opening and closing and see if they lock and unlock and also doing the bathroom fixtures, running water and finding things there and GFCIs and the handrail. Um, but it's, it's fairly easy. There's some cracks in the drywall where these large cathedral ceilings are intersecting. And I'm just taking pictures of those cracks. I think it's just from settlement. 
it could be patched up. My infrared camera, my FLIR, this is a FLIR B-CAM SD, long time ago, bought it, and that's what it looks like. So there's some missing insulation in areas. Some insulation has fallen down in the cavity and it's hot outside, right? It's cool on the inside. And that I can't see with my eyes, but I can see that there's something going on there and they may want to address it. Maybe you start by asking the seller, is this room hotter than the rest during the summertime? Is it difficult to condition? Because um, we have some open gaps in the insulation. Here's the ceiling of the um, first floor living room with the fireplace. Remember the stack, chimney stack on the back side of the house? Large cathedral ceiling. I can't see the insulation because it's a cathedral ceiling. But my infrared camera can show there are some pockets that are missing insulation, maybe because of the electrician um, where the ceiling fan attaches, maybe there's some work done there and the insulation wasn't put back like it should have, or maybe it wasn't installed or blown in well. Same thing here. We can see things with the infrared that we can't see with our eyes. This isn't too bad, but I would still um, think that my client would enjoy seeing these things. There's the first floor, and behind the piece of furniture that I moved, um, there's mold. And this one office space was kind of um, moldy and musty, and it's the same wall um, that is near the kickout flashing problem. So that needs to be addressed. So just opening and closing windows, trying to get to the kitchen. Here's the fireplace, not used at all really. Very clean, actually spider webs. The firewall, the masonry looks really good. It's taking pictures of just about everything. First floor half bath. Here's the kitchen. Garbage disposal works. Sink. Oh, the electrical connection um, at the bottom of the garbage disposal, I always look for that wire clamp, and that's missing there. All receptacles in the kitchen, a countertop, um, uh, need to be GFCI protected. It doesn't work. That one there does not work, so I point to it. Um, and then the dishwasher, turn it on. Um, any islands, I like to try to move them. Uh, we have a microwave detector uh, here. You can stick it in a microwave, and it detects microwaves and it lights up. It's just the shock and awe of doing a, a, an appliance inspection. The, um, the stove top, the range, the oven, turn it on, and um, that's it for the inspection. It went really well after I figured out that kickout flashing area. This is my inspection report, the actual inspection report uh, with confidential information removed. Um, and basically you'll see that I put in all the juicy pictures, right, in my inspection report. Um, the, the stucco of the chimney in the flashing issues, um, the good condition of the roof with some shots of my feet, remember that, in my hand. Um, the gutters look good. Um, the, um, the bottom edge of the stucco is an issue. There's some damaged stucco here and there. There's a bulge in the stucco. Um, there's the water uh, intrusion and damage and mold caused by the missing kickout flashing. It's observed from the crawl space and from the garage. Oops. Let's go like this. Uh, the driveway is in good shape. Exterior water faucets. Um, this handle was actually stuck. It, it was kind of frozen in place. Um, electric receptacle is improperly installed, some water damage at the front door, uh, the heat pump is in good shape, um, missing insulation at the refrigerant line, the interior evaporator is okay, um, the air filter is clean, delayed maintenance, the service tag is years old, um, there's a sewer line, water line coming in. Um, when there's a check valve, there's a check valve here, that's a closed system 
in the house. And when the hot water tank turns on, it heats up water and water expands when it heats up. There should be a relief for that expansion, not the TPR valve, that's just for excessive pressure and temperature. There should be a, a bladder tank installed at the hot water tank. Uh, and that's missing. Um, the TPR valve is not extended to the floor. The grounding wire is disconnected. Um, no labeling at the breakers. Uh, we had the double tap at the wiring. Watermarks. Water intrusion, active wet marks, active water intrusion. The sump pump is not reliable. It's in a, a hole. There's debris in the crawl space that's wet and damp. There's signs of water intrusion throughout the basement and crawl space. Oh, I keep doing that. Sorry about that. Oh, um, the garage, uh, the extension cord, oh, the extension cord um, at the garage door openers. That's not a good thing. Let's see. Uh, there. Um, the dryer exhausts into the garage. Um, the GFCI is not functioning, GFCI protection in the garage. Um, more about the laundry, some problems. Second floor laundry doesn't have a water catch pan. Um, no major structural uh, problems observed in the attic space. The bathroom, um, hot and cold water at the tub are reversed. Um, missing GFCI, there's a leak at the drain. There's no access panel for the tub or shower. GFCI problems, a missing clamp at the electrical connection of the ground fault, uh, um, garbage disposal, uh, missing GFCI protection at the kitchen counter. Um, the kitchen countertop is not secure, could pose a safety problem or hazard, especially for children. We don't want that tipping over and crushing someone. Um, and the electrical, um, the uh, kitchen appliances work. Uh, the infrared, I take some pictures of the infrared, and this is what I saw with my infrared camera. And the interior is basically the good, except for the mold uh, behind that one office um, room, piece of furniture. And there's visible signs of mold in the house, in the basement, in the crawl space, and in the dining room. Other structures on the outside, just by courtesy, I put them in there. Um, I just want to make sure that the, the shed's okay, no big deals, but the play apparatus in the backyard is not part of my home inspection. I don't want any children to get hurt, but I don't inspect um, playgrounds. And I leave this letter for every um, homeowner or occupant that we, we inspected everything, over 500 items, some of which were tested. Um, we tried to put everything back to its original setting. Some things were moved, but here's a, a short list of things that you should check right after I leave, uh, just to make sure that they're still um, back to their original setting, like the thermostat, uh, GFCI receptacles and breakers, um, refrigerators and freezers in the garage or in the basement that may have been unplugged or, or need to be reset, clocks, kitchen appliances, doors, coffee makers, curtains, drapes, and blinds. Um, I had a, a, a homeowner say that I left the blinds askew once, uh, kind of a, a complaint, but um, no big deal. You'll get those. Uh, one of the things that you could do is, um, as a marketing, you know, InterNACHI has a marketing team. Um, they work for you. Call them up. Here's one of the ideas of our marketing team. It's a lunchbox, kind of, and you leave it as a leave behind for the seller because every seller is, uh, is they're going to move somewhere, and oftentimes they move in the same neighborhood or within 20 miles, um, and they need a home inspector. So um, what you do is you attach your business card here, and it says, we really appreciate you. Thank you for allowing us to inspect your home. Please look inside, and you can put anything you want in here. You can put candy, you can put a gift card, you can put uh, a letter, you can put a, a sample report, and you just leave it on the countertop. That's really cool. Yep. It's one of the marketing ideas. The other idea to communicate that every home should be inspected every year as part of a homeowner's routine maintenance plan. Um, this book, the home maintenance book, now that you've had a home inspection, this is the standard 
one. You can customize the cover totally with your brand, your logo, your pictures. Um, and we do that. The design work um, is of no cost. You just buy um, a certain number of home maintenance books and we'll redesign it for you with a customized um, cover, full color, inside and out. And that book helps, um, it refers you, at first, it tells your client to hire you again as part of um, a home maintenance plan because you take care of your clients. They're your neighbors now and every home should be inspected every year and part of a routine maintenance plan should be a home inspection. So you should be hired again to come in and keep that home maintained and in good condition. Um, let's see. Um, Jeff decided to stay for class and he rescheduled his home inspection um, for a later time. That's cool. Uh, you have two neutrals going under one lug. Yep, back 20 years ago or 15 years ago when I did that inspection, that was not part of something that I called out. It would be today, right? We know better today. Uh, talk about how you chat with a client in the kitchen at the end if you have time, Arturo asks. Um, that's where I finish everything. And I make sure that my client is 100% satisfied before I ask for money. You could ask for a credit card if you're doing like a website online scheduling system. You can, you can have your client secure their schedule, um, scheduled inspection by entering their credit card. That's kind of cool because you have the credit card information. But what we did was we um, made sure that our client was 100% happy and then we gave them the invoice. Um, they saw the invoice and then they, we struck their credit card. So that was the main thing. You know, getting paid, you got to get paid. Um, I like to get paid right after the inspection as well. Instead of being paid at closing, it's up to you. That's your business model. Um, I like being in the kitchen because well, everyone loves being in the kitchen, right? At the end, I don't want to be outside. I don't, don't want to be anywhere else during a, an inspection, at the end of the inspection, in order to go over the summary. So what I do is I bring in my printer, actually, and I hook up my laptop to my printer and I'll print out the summary sheet so that the real estate agent can take action. And that's what they really want. They want a list of things to go do or negotiate over. And so that's what I give my client. If my client wanted the entire report printed out, I would do that as well. It's really up to what my client wants. And my clients, I've learned, simply by asking their agents, what do you want at the end of the inspection? And what they wanted was a list of things, problems that need to be fixed or negotiated over. And so that's what I provided them. And later on, um, I clicked the button and sent the entire report. Turns out hardly anybody reads the entire report on the day of the inspection. They may read it later. They may print it out. But what's really important is that summary sheet. What they do with the inspection report, the entire inspection report, is that they print it out and show their friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, what they received during their inspection. So this is one of my typical home inspection reports. I used, we used to bind every, we used to print every report um, in black and white and send them a link to the, the electric uh, format of the report and then bind it in a three ring binder and then put the home maintenance book at the end, right? And then just fill it up with stuff, right? Like now I would offer a home energy score, you know, so that they know how their home scores and compares with their neighbors. It's like a, an energy inspection report um, from one to 10, the score is, and a 10 is really good, one is really bad. Um, if I wanted to try to sell ancillary services, Probably at the kitchen at the end of the inspection is not the right time. But um, if I see indications of mold, I may want to pull out a rack card. And if I'm not very good at selling ancillary services while I'm in performing a home inspection, I can just read off this card. It says, you know, um, let me inspect your home for mold while I'm here. Why? Well, you flip it over. It says mold damages what it grows on. And the longer it grows, the more damage it can cause. So while I'm here, why don't I do a mold 
inspection for you, or for you to do a radon test, right? Would you like me to do a radon test? Let me test your home for radon. Your client says, why? Flip it over. You cannot see, smell, or taste radon, but it may be a problem in your home. And the only way to see it to, is to test for it, right? So there's these rack cards you can buy off of our marketing department to help you communicate to your client ancillary services that you provide. This is a really nice, this gives weight to my inspection, right? Actually, physical weight. It's the oomph, right? They feel like they got something. And you can buy all this stuff from uh, our e-commerce partner, Inspector Outlet. Couple bucks per. I never paid for any of this, by the way. This is not, this is no cost to me. This was no overhead to me. This was free to me to give. You know why? Because it cost me about five bucks putting all this together, all these little inserts, the binder, the home maintenance book, $2.70, and the um, paper and the ink. It was about $5, maybe $5.75, right? But I increased my fee by $10, and I allowed my client to purchase their own printing. I didn't pay for it. I allowed my client to pay for it. And they bought my coffee for the day. So when you're thinking about adding value, it has to be a really good deal for your business. If the perceived value, if your consumer, your client's perceived perception of the value is much greater than the cost, then that's a good business decision, right? This, if I was to pay for it, would cost me only about six bucks, right? The perceived value of this is much greater than six dollars. My clients valued this much more than six. They didn't realize it was only five, six bucks, right? And on top of that, I didn't even have this overhead. I transferred the cost of that overhead to my clients. Each client bought their own home maintenance book, their own three ring binder, their own printing, their own inserts, right? Um, infrared camera. Let's see if I can find it. Boop. Infrared camera. I never bought my own infrared camera, right? What I did was I initially bought it, but then raised my fee and allowed my clients to hire a home inspector who uses infrared during an inspection for free. If I add value like this service to my inspection service, I don't charge for it. I raise my fee. The more value, the more overwhelming value you provide, the higher fees you can demand, right? So think of overwhelming your clients with incredible value that they perceive, the service that they perceive as incredible value, right? And if it costs you very little to provide that, it's a good business decision. And don't pay for everything. Allow your clients to pay for your infrared camera. Um, Doug asks, do you have CI receptacles in the kitchen? Is this okay as a receptacle would no longer have two breakers to one receptacle? You know what? I want to send you to, let's see, how can I get there? Our library of inspection articles. It's nachi.org forward slash nachi.org slash articles. And you go down and we have an excellent article about inspecting GFCI and AFCI protection. It's an excellent article, right? And um, I would highly recommend, if you have any questions about GFCIs, especially in kitchens or the locations where GFCIs and AFCIs are located nowadays, according to modern code, go to this article. That'll help. Because uh, I didn't quite fully understand, Doug, your, your question. Do you recommend estimating repair costs to correct in the report? In Pennsylvania, where that home inspection was performed, um, you were allowed to provide uh, cost estimates 
uh, if you provided the source of your cost estimate. Um, and my clients wanted that. So if I'm, I'm in Colorado now, um, I would do the same thing. I would provide an estimate within a range and provide the source of the estimate, which was me, um, because that's what they want to know, that how big of a deal is um, a GFCI? GFCI itself is uh, not much money. Having someone come and install a new GFCI, well, it takes maybe a couple hundred bucks, done. And that's what they want to know. Um, how big of a problem, monetary problem, is the missing kickout at that house? Well, probably thousands of dollars, five, ten thousand dollars. Not sure. That's a huge range, big money, but it could be that much. Uh, and that's a different price. That's a different kind of degree in severity than the GFCI, right? So if you list um, defects in a summary, I always like to show. Uh, I get, um, express a severity, give, give the degree, communicate how big of a problem this is compared to all the other ones. So the most biggest, the biggest problem in this home inspection was the kickout flashing for five to $10,000. The least one was, uh, least expensive was probably the GFCI or maybe the TPR extension, maybe the dirty air filter, something like that, a couple hundred bucks. Um, how does InterNACHI offer assistance with wind mitt and four-point agreements as well as litigation agreements, of course, which have to be read over by an attorney? Gotcha. Um, you want to go to nachi.org slash nachi.org slash, is it documents? It is documents. All these URLs. nachi.org slash nachi.org slash documents. There's like um, a huge resource of legal documents there. Um, one of the systems we have is um, home inspection contracts, and also there's an online agreement system as well. Um, boy, there's a lot of things there. But the online agreement system is a free online agreement system between you and your client, and you we have templates for wind mitigation and four point within that system. Just take a look, open it up. It's fully customized too. So, um, and you can convert this online agreement system, which can be um, sent to your client and digitally signed, and you can track their signature. Um, it can also be downloaded as a PDF. Uh, and we also have within the uh, four point and wind mitigation courses, um, agreement templates, suggestions, and documents within the courses itself in the beginning. How should a person handle it when an agent asks? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, how should a person handle it when an agent asks if I'm almost done with the inspection? Oh. Um, the agent already knows that um, the, uh, how long I'm going to take. I've already set a lot of expectations. The expectation of my client has already been set, and the expectation of their agent and the homeowner has already been set when the home inspection is scheduled. My office manager, it's great when you have one. If you don't, you're going to have to work out a system, put systems in place that save your time and allow to, you to do things automatically without you thinking. So a scheduling system would be good um, that sends out an email and sets the expectations of those parties so that everyone's on the same page so that they know if I start at 8 o'clock, I might show up early. I often do. Where I'm from, if you show up on time, you're late. So I'll show up early on a home inspection, I get on the roof before my client shows up. Ideally, they would pull up in the driveway and I'd wave to them from the roof. Um, and then um, they know that, and then they know it's gonna be about a two to three hour process. So we'll be done in about 11. The homeowner can come home at 12 o'clock for sure, if it's an eight o'clock job, and get right back into their home. And they'll see this on their kitchen table, right? Because I'll be out of there. Um, if we're doing a radon test, um, I'll probably show up two to four days prior to the home inspection, place the radon test kits, tell the seller closed house building conditions, and during the home inspection, in, right in the beginning, I'll go in and, and retrieve that radon test. So all of this stuff, you should have systems in place that saves your time 
and automatically helps you do your job better. And one of them is um, setting expectations with messages, emails, sending out reminders. Um, so have the house ready for the home inspection. That, that was, uh, that's really important. Um, Eric, what do you prefer in Spectoria that, Spectora that HIP doesn't offer? Or what makes you use Spectora of a HIP? Reasons why I asked is because I purchased HIP. I purchased, uh, I have HIP too, uh, Home Inspector Pro. It's a great software. It runs on anything. Um, mobile devices, um, laptops, PC, Mac, Apple. Um, Home Gauge, I think, works on PC. That's a great one. Um, my fingers work better with this new Spectora software, um, and the video works really well too. So if I want to, I'm into video. I'm video based. I want to know how to write a report that has a lot of video in it. And so far, um, this is they're taking the lead on that. It's really easy to do. So um, I think there's a free trial you can or contact them. I don't care. Um, I, I'm I don't care if, what software you use. Um, but th they are a pretty good software. They're going to our convention too. They're going to present on um, search engine optimization. They'll have a table there t as well. So, oh, that's how I should leave you all. Yeah, so we have a free inspectors convention in 2018 coming up in Atlantic City in just a few months, about 130 days from now. And it's at natchi.org slash convention. It's free for InterNACHI members. Everyone else has to pay. Um, it's a free convention, and we're going to have a really good time there. Um, each receptacle in the kitchen has different circuits, different breakers. Uh, that's true. GFCI receptacles do not have this option. That's true. So, um, and there's also uh, a new code that says from any sink, six feet from any sink. So if you have a receptacle on a wall that doesn't have a kitchen counter, kitchen wall, no kitchen counter, receptacle, Within six feet of the kitchen sink, it has to be GFCI protected. That's kind of cool. Um, all right. I don't see any more questions. Um, that was a good class. I really liked it. Hope you had a lot of fun. Um, the recording of the class will be on Natchi TV. Um, and we'll have another class coming up probably um, in the new year. So in January 2018, we'll have a new free online class. And um, if there are any questions, feel free to contact us. But please consider coming to the Free Inspectors Convention hosted by InterNACHI. It's the only free convention out there for home inspectors. If you're a member of InterNACHI, it's totally free. So please visit natchiorg slash convention. And I'll see you in the next class. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.